So thanks so much for coming. The, the title of my talk, and I hope it's going to be more of an interactive discussion, is Survivorship, How Do You Want It To Be? And um, the reason for that is when we get diagnosed with cancer, advice seems to fly at us from all sorts of directions. We're told, do this, don't do that, some guidance on how to handle our lives. And people are very, very well intentioned. And sometimes the feeling can be overwhelmed. The diagnosis of cancer in and of itself, living with cancer, living after cancer, can be overwhelming in and of itself. Add to that all kinds of well-intentioned advice and guidance and um, ideas, and it can be, we can be left with a feeling of being out of control. And being out of control in and of itself is a terrible feeling, and it has a really negative impact on our lives. So my hope with tonight's talk is that we're going to take a step back and, and take a look and say, how do we want it to be? And rather than just surviving cancer, thriving in our lives. So that's my hope. How to start? Um, I am a health behaviorist. I'm a prof at Western. I've been uh, there for this is my 16th year teaching at Western. I uh, do all kinds of research on behavior change, specifically with regard to health-related behaviors. I'm also a spouse, I'm a parent, I'm a grandparent, I'm an aunt, I'm a daughter of two cancer survivors, I'm a friend, and I'm a cancer survivor myself. And my belief is that our, part of our journey with cancer is figuring out where our role of survivor fits in, in our everyday life, and how do we integrate that into all of the other roles that we have in life. For me, this was a very, very different talk to prepare. I do talks, um, all kinds of talks, all over the place, but they're always about my research. And so it's very, I'm very comfortable to be able to share with you my objective findings about all these other people. And when Anita invited me to do tonight's talk, I thought, oh, sure, absolutely. We, you know, I'll have the behavioral piece in there and make sure that we have an opportunity for folks to take a look at how they'd like their survivorship to be. And then when I started writing the talk, I realized there was no way to do it with any kind of authenticity without actually sharing my own stuff, which is uh, this is the first in however long I've been doing talks, 20 years, that I'm actually sharing stuff about myself. So it's a, it's a very different kind of experience. And my intention is to try and integrate some stuff that I know from a behavioral perspective that works for people with my, using my own stuff as examples. That being said, all of us are going to have different experiences with cancer. It's, um, it's the kind of thing where so many people are diagnosed with cancer. It's hard to find a person who hasn't been touched by cancer in some way, shape, or form, whether it's themselves or a loved one. And although there's so many of us, and in some ways that creates a community, in other ways, um, when you have it, it can be a very isolating and lonely experience. And um, so it's, it's a very different kind of experience. Many of us have um, stories that have similarities, and all of us have a story that is completely unique and owned only by us. And so some of my stuff is going to be relevant, some of it won't be relevant. And I'm going to try to make sure that I differentiate what's the research and what's my experience that might help to illuminate some of the information. My plan for our time is um, hopefully that I'm not going to just talk. Um, I'd love for it to be as interactive as you'd like it to be with absolutely no pressure. So whatever your comfort is in talking, sharing, giving ideas, um, and absolutely no pressure. Okay? It's not going to be like in class where what I do is I just wait until someone says something. You know, Bueller, Bueller. So I won't be doing that. I want to talk a little bit about the toll that cancer takes on us because the toll, obviously cancer is a physical disease. It impacts us physically. But it's so much more than physical. And I want to talk about that because that can't be shortchanged. The impact of that can be very profound. I want to talk a little bit about the importance of control. And this, by the way, um, you know, I'm a survivor and I'm also uh, the loved ones. My mom and dad are both survivors. And so uh, it's a journey. Do we have both survivors and supporters? We've got both? Okay. It's a journey for both, whether, whatever end of it you're on. 
And um, my personal experience that it was much harder for me when it was people close, with, close to me who had it than it was for me to have it. Um, and that probably leads me to control. I have a very strong relationship with control. And uh, I was intended to be funny. Okay. <laughs> And control is actually a really important part of our health, um, our psyche. And the impact that cancer has on control can be quite profound. And so whether you're a survivor or a supporter, I, I want to do some talking about control. And the importance of making some choices ourselves for how do we want to be in this journey, whatever it is, because everything's changed. For many of us, that's the experience that we have a lot of changes. And then my hope is by the end of the evening is that maybe we'll take, each of us will think about taking a step, a purposeful step in the direction of something we do want to control that's very positive for us. Okay? Now, so that's my plan, but I'm very flexible in my plan. So what I actually am really interested to know is if at the end of tonight, you go home and say to somebody, this was a worthwhile evening, what will have happened? You have no expectations. I can do anything. Yes. That I can identify with some of the things that you're saying. Okay. Do you feel a connection? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. I have some ideas to help the survivor. Okay. Otherwise, no expectations? Yeah. An exact definition of what we mean by a survivor. Ah. Why? What does it mean to be a survivor? Yeah. I mean, time constraint on that, hmm. so five years is considered for a survivor, I don't know, I mean, is it different definitions, is that a prolonged thing? Yeah, so actually let's chat a little bit about that. I am not a cancer researcher, so I want to make that very clear. My understanding is that there's different terms for different, that, that the definition is different for different cancers. So the cancer that I had um, doesn't have any kind of duration, I had melanoma, and uh, you can't see because I've got boots on, but it looks like I got a little shark bite out of my leg. And um, melanoma is, my understanding is one that there isn't the, the five year, all is joyful and well in the world. Um, but then I think with some others, there is a five year is a, a magical kind of, if it hasn't come back, it's, it's good. But I don't know the answer to that. So, Let's talk a little bit about the impact of cancer. Many of us um, have certainly had the physical impact of cancer and the physical impact of surviving the treatments. There's, um, you know, I remember when my mom went through her treatments, um, she was told, no, there's no such thing as chemotherapy being associated with, um, with arthritis. No such thing. No, absolutely no such thing. She said, well, but you know what, I'm really finding that from, that it's a direct relationship at the exact same, no, absolutely not. And then of course, there's very high connection between, between that. Um, she was also told that no, she must just be getting older and losing some of her memory because clearly there was no impact of chemotherapy on memory, right? And now there's chemo brain is actually a term. So there's all kinds, and then there's the surviving the physical impact of our surgeries and how those impact other things. I had a series of surgeries and I'm s about six years out and I'm still experiencing the impact. And the surgeries were, were beautiful and they went fabulously, but you know, you got a little thing that's missing down there and it kind of tilts that and then this and then your nerves are all messed up. And so, you know, things don't kind of move the way that they used to move. And, that wasn't something I was going to be patient with, so I thought it would be good to start playing squash right away. So I completely wrecked most of my body doing that. But there's all kinds of physical impacts that most of us, many of us, have experienced. And those physical impacts, as well as the emotional impact in and of itself from the moment you get the diagnosis, the emotional impact is also profound. And it has a very heavy impact that a lot of times we're not prepared for. We're given the brochures and the pamphlets as we leave the office of what to expect. Here's what you go into treatment. Here's how many weeks it's going to take. Here's when you can expect this to happen. Here's when you can expect that to happen. But my experience anyway, and those of close to me, has been that there's very little to say, and here's how you cope with this news today. 
And here's how you cope with the feeling of being horrifically betrayed by your body. And here's how you cope with every single thing from this moment being different in your day. And that emotional impact has a huge impact on our confidence, um, both as we're going through it and even afterwards, because we have to learn to maneuver in the world a little bit differently. Is this ringing true? Okay, because do shake if I'm way off. Okay. Right. Otherwise, it's going to be therapy for Jen. <laughs> okay. uh, a sense of, sense of control in our lives shifts the moment we get that diagnosis, because you know what? That day, our schedule changed. Right? We got the diagnosis and it wasn't just, oh, let's check that off. Now what do I have at 10.30? You know? I vividly remember the phone calls because I had phone calls on my cell phone, phone calls, phone calls on um, my work number. And, um, and I remember coming home after work and thinking, they don't usually call me to come in the same day to get back my test results. Like, they called and said, we need you to come in tonight at 7 o'clock. And I thought, I don't think that's good, you know? Some, you know, something tells me, but then I thought, well, maybe it's because the Privacy Act. I had good convincing. But anyway, I knew what was going on. And I remember coming home and thinking, how am I going to tell my husband? Well, I'll just make it really light. And we'll just, you know, it just is what it is, and we'll see. And I remember distinctly come, pulling in the driveway, and he was cutting the grass. And he was on the other side of, we have a, a little chain link fence. He's on, on the other side and we just made eye contact. And I remember saying to him, um, we need to go to the doctor tonight. And he said, I know, they called me too. And in that moment, the exchange, we just paused and everything was gonna be different. It was in that exchange that everything was said. So we had dinner. <laughs> he talked about, what are the kids doing? Like, just, because what do you do, right? No one says, everything is different now. I had no more control over how my life was going to go, and neither did he. So you kind of had to figure out how to roll with it. Our perspectives often shift with the diagnosis of the big C. For some of us, it's this opening of the world, and wow, totally take life by the bootstraps, whatever it is. And for others, it's a terror of the world. And for others, it depends on the day we're in. It shifts day by day. But our perspectives often shift. My journey has been one of a very, um, my perspectives of life has shifted from, from day one and I think is continuing to evolve now of how I fit cancer and being a survivor into my life. Okay. And all the advice. All the advice of here's how you go through it. Here's what's going to be best for you. This is what you should do. You really mustn't do that. You really should do this. Oh, you know what I did? That's what works for me. You shouldn't do that. I don't care what so-and-so said. And it's just like enough overwhelming. You're overwhelmed as it is, and it can just sometimes be too much. Is this feeling accurate? Okay. Let's talk about the advice. Some of the advice is fabulous. Some of the advice stinks. Some of the advice is fabulous, but the timing stinks. I can recall, I think it was like, it was the week I got diagnosed. And I can recall some very well-intentioned woman who I didn't know well, sending me an email saying, I heard you got diagnosed. You're gonna find cancer is the greatest gift in your life. I thought, I am not a violent woman. <laughs> but this was not the experience I was in. You really just need to look on the bright side of how this is going to really foster wonderful things in your life. <clears throat> and I thought, well, I'm not going to say what I thought because we're on camera, but <laughs> it was probably gonna, good advice at some point, but it was not the advice I was in a place of receiving at the time. And so my back went up and I felt very, um, very alone. This is not the experience I'm in. Maybe I'm doing it wrong because I don't appreciate being diagnosed with cancer. I was kind of going along tickety-boo, quite happy. This was not in my plan. 
What we know from a research perspective is unsolicited advice. From psychologically, what happens is our backs go up, we dig our heels in, even if it's really good stuff. If we're not interested in the advice, if we're not receptive to it, we will not take it in. And in fact, we will often do the opposite. So the advice actually, and we need to know this as we're trying to help other cancer survivors, needs to be offered only with permission. I have some information that might be valuable. Would you like to hear it? And be prepared for no. That's an okay answer. Because sometimes people know, you know, when you, I can't hear anything else right now, I will let you know when I'm ready for it. Okay. So the advice is something we really need to be careful of, especially when we have found things that have worked beautifully for us. We need to also be mindful that not everybody's going to choose to go along their journey the same way that we chose ours. Okay. Let's talk about control. Again, from a research perspective, we know that having a sense of control is incredibly important for our health. It's important for our mental health, it's important for our physical health, and it's actually important for our longevity. Where do you find control has been disrupted? What are some common... Yeah. When the doctor tells you there's no cure. When the doctor tells you there's no cure. Right, so what are you supposed to do? How do you, how do you clamp onto something? Any other areas of your life where you're finding control is taking a back seat? Your time is not your own. Your time is not your own. There's no choice. You've got to go to your radiation every day. Got to go to your radiation every day, and sometimes the times change, so it's really challenging to make plans. And all the plans have to change the minute your appointment changes. Absolutely. You can't turn your ringer off. You can't decide to take a nap, turn your ringer off, if you're waiting to hear about your appointment. It's very difficult to explain to other people and sometimes you don't want to offer people an explanation, and yet other times you want to offer them an explanation that isn't too personal, and it, it, it's not something that you chose to have, and yet you are being forced to deal with all of the, the nuances and all of it. Okay. Is, is it accurate to say that, that control Lack of control is something that is a common experience? Okay. Okay, because I'm building from my experience and I want to make sure that I'm not missing the boat on what's uh, happening for others. I think another point you mentioned uh, is the waiting. The waiting, in some ways, um, can be an experience where cancer's in control and you're simply its driver. You're there to drive it to the appointment. You're there to wait for this. You're here waiting for the phone call, hoping for the phone call, hoping that you might be able to get some sleep tonight. Okay. Where are we? Yes? You have no control of what you expect on the family, those people. Yeah. I mean, That's a good point. If you've got children, I can't imagine. You have no, con you have no control on the impact that your diagnosis, your experience has on those around you. And you may not even know how they're reacting. Yes, you might not even know how it's impacting them. I, I remember distinctly saying to my husband, um, I can imagine this is horrific for you, and I know that I can't support you in this. I know that I have to be very selfish and I have to let this be about me, and I need to lean on you incredibly heavily, and I need to make sure that you go and get support somewhere, because I know I can't do this. That's a hard thing to say to someone. Yes? How do people choose not to tell anyone, mm -hmm. only the spouse, the non-human So the so the the comment the, the the question for discussion is for folks who decide not to tell others is the rationale because they are still maintaining some kind of control. Um, I'm going to guess on this. Um, I have limited experience with that particular topic. I think sometimes it's we feel we're protecting other people. 
that I don't want so-and-so to feel the pain of this. Uh, I think sometimes we're protecting ourselves as well. I can't handle seeing so-and-so experiencing the pain of this. Um, my husband and I lied to people at first. <laughs> Let's be honest with you, because we're not on film or anything. Um, and that w we told people that I had cancer, but the orig original diagnosis that we got, it doesn't matter how it got messed up, um, but the original diagnosis that we heard translated into a um, that I had about nine months to live. And so we didn't, we didn't know what to do with it. So we just decided that we we're going to keep that little tidbit to ourselves. And um, I'm sure we just missed the decimal point when we got the information. And, uh, you know, we were pretty stressed out at the time. And so when we got home and we looked up what the prognosis was and realized it was, you know, I was going to be lucky to make it nine months, we thought, well, we're not going to call everybody and say, hey, what are you doing at Easter? <laughs> Right? It was just, it was too overwhelming for us to handle. We had no idea. There's no manual, you know, you don't get diagnosed and then here's a manual on how you, how do you tell your children? How do you tell your parents? How do you tell your aunts and uncles? How do you tell your best friends? There's no manual on how to do it. And um, our choice in doing that was we didn't want to speak it. We didn't want to actually give it energy that this was going to be a, an accurate thing. Um, and I don't think we put much more thought into it than that. I just remember us, we'd both gone to our, we both have a home office, we went to our home offices, we'd both done the same thing, we met in the family room, looked at each other, and he said to me, we can't speak this, and I said, no, we can't. We just won't energize it. It was done. And I, so I don't think we put much more thought into that. But I think that speaks to the whole idea that I don't think there's any way to do it right or wrong. I don't think, you know, there's no um, grade report on how to do survivorship. And I think that each of us goes through our own journey and we get to be in charge of how that looks and what we do. You know, I never lied to our family before and that was a choice that we made in that moment because that felt right in the moment. There wasn't a whole lot of conscious thought that went into it. But I think one of the things to keep in mind is you're going through your own journey wherever you are in it, the start, the middle, you've been surviving for years and years and years and years. My hope is that you don't judge yourself for how you do it. Because I don't think there's a way to do it wrong. Because there's certainly not a way to do it right. There's only a way to do it your way. And I don't think there's any smooth path for anybody that just says, oh, here's the perfect things of, of getting through. Because we don't plan for cancer. We don't plan for that diagnosis. No. We don't say, well, you know, it's going to fit in now. That'll be really convenient now. It's waiting until now, until a good time. There is never a good time. And so when you're in a particularly unusual um, environment, it can be even more stressful. In terms of taking a moment, because the journey, the hurry up and wait, we can be going, 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 stop, going, 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 stop. My experience was it was very, um, it took me a long time to take a stop and say, okay, I am whirling, I was a whirling dervish, it felt like, I have no idea I just felt like I was spinning constantly. I couldn't do anything right because I couldn't focus on anything properly. Should I be doing this? Should I not be doing that? And it took me a while to kind of take a step back and say, okay, I don't know what's happening tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen in a month. I don't know how any of this is going to turn out. So how am I going to choose to let it be today? And that doesn't mean that we can control being upset or distraught. It simply means that we can have control in some part of it. What is something today that I'm going to decide for me? And I, I want to talk, we'll get more into that in a moment. So again, um, I want to just say that my story, it may or may not be reflective of your own experiences. For me, everything changed and nothing changed all at the same time. Like my whole world changed, but the bizarre normalcy going all around just was this most, is, is that feel familiar to you? Just the strangeness of like the stoplights working and people going grocery shopping and like don't, you know, it just made me crazy. I, I, I had a hard time rectifying how do these things fit together? Everything in the world has changed and everything was still, I still had to pay the bills. I still had to do all the normal things in my, all of my other roles in life. Um, and I found that a very, Bizarre, bizarre experience for sure. 
my mortality took center stage, particularly the first week where um, we were living with this experience that, um, that I had nine months to live. You know, just this whole realization that I was a saver. I was saving for retirement. I was, we're going to do all this traveling later. Like, that's, well, we're saving for it. It's not, it, no, this is very inconvenient. And, um, and then all of a sudden realizing, well, there might not be much of a later. And how do I want to be with that now? Um, and, and sort of these bizarre, almost like philosophical exis what's it, existential questions that really wasn't my way of thinking. It was like, well, tomorrow I'm going to do this. And so all of a sudden, kind of changing everything around. And at the same time, having to do all of these normal, bizarre, daily, daily normal things that you do. And, you know, figuring out, for me, I had these graduate students that had timelines for... <laughs> for when they needed to finish. So the bizarre thing, right? The next day, next morning, I went into work because I didn't know what to do. I was just going to sit at home, like that sit at home and wait. So I went into work. So I thought, well, I have to tell them because I got to figure out how I'm going to finish them because I'm going to be gone before any of them are going to be ready to defend their theses. And this was a very important concern for me that morning. Right? Bizarreness, right? Because I thought, well, I can't tell them what's happening. I just have to try and get them to move their schedules up a little bit so we can finish. I mean, it was just ridiculousness. But trying to figure out how you rectify the daily duties with the reality that everything is, in life has changed. How do you deal with your own feelings? How do you deal with the feelings of other people? Um, how do you sort out what I experienced as being very new relationships? Some of the people who I thought would be there, like that fell off the face of the earth devastating, just heart-wrenchingly devastating. And then others who I thought, you know, I won't hear from them, holy doodle, did they show up for me. And finding a way to avenge, I did not come to it in a very graceful way at first, I'll be honest with you, but finding a way to eventually realize everybody has a relationship with cancer. And my diagnosis with cancer and their reaction to it was all about them and nothing to do with me. Those people who couldn't be with me on this journey, it was about them. It wasn't about whether they truly did care about me or not. It was about them. The people who don't know what to say, so they say nothing, it's not that they don't want to say something. It's they don't know what to say because they don't want to bring it up. On the off chance you forgot you had it. <laughs> right? Oh, geez, I forgot about that. Okay? It took me a long time to rectify these new relationships. And it's taken me a long time to forgive some of the people who fell off the face of the earth. You know, the, the really mature part of me wants to just let it go. And there's other parts that, like, that hurt. I really needed them, you know. Um, so I don't know if that's similar for any of you. But there's these strange things that you don't know you're even needing to deal with. Yes, sir? What about the not knowing? I mean, you don't know if you're, you nothing that hardest thing. You, I mean, you were saying, you know, you had nine months, and mm -hmm. that obviously wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. And the not knowing, do you live your life like you have to spend all your savings? Mm -hmm. Do you save? Well, I mean, yeah. I think that would be the hardest thing, not knowing what to do. How do I behave sure. now? Yeah. There's no certainty in my outcome, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm actually going to speak to, to my experience with that in a moment. And again, I don't think there's a right way. I really don't think there's a right way to do it or a wrong way to do it. I think it's finding what sits most comfortably in your gut of your way. Yes, Can I just ask you, how yeah. long did it take to find out that it was your first it obviously wasn't going to be nine months? No, it was, it was two weeks. There were two very long weeks. Um, no sleep. Yeah, it was no sleep and um, some very curious reflections, for sure. Um, but I don't regret them. I don't regret them at all. Okay. Even at the time, I thought, well, OK. I guess this is how this story's going. So um, how I, what has been part of my journey, um, certainly early in diagnosis, was I reflected on my life. And the morning, the next morning, when I was driving to work, um, I turned on the radio and a song, I think it's Tim McGraw, song came, I literally was driving, turned on the radio and this song came on, um, 
I don't know the title of it, but the lyrics are, I hope you live like you're dying. You know, I wrote a bowl and did all these things. And I thought, oh, for, oh, for goodness sakes. <laughs> right? And I turned it off and I thought, my belief system is that, um, that there's a, something to be gained from everything. I don't necessarily believe any, I used to believe there was a reason for everything. I don't necessarily believe that anymore. I believe that there's something that can be learned from everything. And so I thought, okay, clearly this is happening for a reason. Clearly I can get something from this. So I turned it back on and I thought, okay, so I guess I better start thinking about this as I'm on my way to organize everything at work for everybody. Um, how, do I, how do I live like I'm dying? How do, I, how do I engage with that experience and what do I do with that? And um, what I realized was I didn't want to do anything different. I absolutely loved my life. There was a few things that I, you know, if we have our quote unquote bucket list that I thought, well, you know, I've always wanted to go to Italy. That was always a dream. Um, haven't done that, but really when it comes down to it, I love all of the ups. I appreciate all of the downs. I am just really grateful for, for the life I have. And then I started worrying. So I thought, well, then I guess that means I really am done. Because I don't have that thing that says, no, you must keep going until. It was just this like, oh, well. Okay, so I, it was a really bizarre experience, but I was very grateful because I thought, okay, I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm really happy in my life. I was very content. So that was how my uh, journey with that started. I got a lot of advice. I did a lot of research. Um, I made a lot of changes. I'm a foodie. I love food. I just, um, I just love, love food. I love cooking food, I love preparing food. I read recipe books as, as a fun thing to do. I just, I love food. And so I thought, okay, well, um, how do I want to do this with food? I got a lot of information about food. And I made a lot of changes with, with food for myself. I cut out um, refined sugars, and that's just good for everything. I cut that out, and I started looking at food as my philosophy with food now is if it doesn't give back, it doesn't, it doesn't get in. Now, red wine does have benefits, okay? um, but that's been my philosophy with food now, so I made some changes there. I started meditating. I was really crappy at it, like really, really crappy at it. I think I'm probably the worst meditator in the world, but research says that meditation is incredibly valuable for our mental health, for our physical health. Um, I don't know if anybody here meditates. It's harder than it looks. Okay, do you find it's harder than it looks, yeah? So I actually got a, a CD, um, and I got a CD that actually was specifically for cancer where you visualize, so it was like an active guided meditation where um, I visualized the healthy cells actually eating the unhealthy cells and visualizing oxygen moving through my body. And I found that really helpful because the, the guided piece um, took me to that place of, okay, and I felt a sense of control. I felt a sense of, I, I am, I am contr in control of focusing on this. And that in of itself was valuable for me. I recommitted to exercise once I could. I was about four months where I wasn't able to be mobile at all. And uh, it was a real challenge because I was a, a lifetime athlete and that's how I dealt with stress. Whenever I was stressed, I went for a run, I did some exercise and that's how I dealt with it. And then my stress mechanism, my mechanism to deal with stress was gone because I was predominantly in bed or I had a, a office chair that I used crutches to get around the main floor, um, but I couldn't exercise. I couldn't use that as my stress coping mechanism. So about four, four months later, it's amazing how your taut muscles kind of turn to mush very quickly. And, um, but I hadn't really recognized this. I was still in my mind firm. And we went away for uh, a weekend in Toronto shortly after everything was, like, I could move and I was done treatment and whatnot. And um, we were staying in this hotel, and I, I got out of the shower, and there was a full, huge mirror there. And I was devastated. I was absolutely devastated. I guess I, I wasn't ready to see what was there until I was ready to see what was there. And it was just loose. So I came running out of the bathroom, yelling to my husband, I'm loose! I'm loose! Well, we're in a hotel for the weekend. He's like, my naked wife is running out of the bathroom yelling, she's loose. 
<laughs> I'm like, no, I'm loose. I've got no muscle. I've got, it's just, it's just hanging. Everything's hanging. And I, I said to him, when did this happen? And I mean, there's no denying it. So he's just like deer caught in a headlights. When did this happen? Well, it's been gradual. And then there was, why didn't you tell me? Like, really? That was winnable, right? And so at that point, it was amazing because I'd never not been active. And it was as if I had never been active a day in my life, starting from zero. And I found that a real challenge. But I recommitted to exercise, and I changed my perspective on exercise. That it wasn't a successful day if I did an hour. I was going to be successful walking around the block. And then I was going to be successful doing something else, and then something else. So I had to change my, my own standards of what success was. So it wasn't going to be less than. I wasn't doing less. I was changing my standards for myself. So these are some of the things that I, I committed to. And how did it work? Well, a couple other things. Um, I was a high achiever, so one of the things I uh, chose to do was I have the ability to work from home quite a lot. So I chose to take that option. And I'm in an environment now where I don't have a lot of stressful things around me and a lot of the work that I do. I save less now and I, I, save less and I enjoy m now more. So um, I didn't blow the, the savings. But I am a little more moderate with them, and I'm very comfortable to spend them. Because my, I was very much a save for a rainy day, and I remember Don saying to me, babe, it's raining. Let's do something. And so we went to Italy for a month. And uh, so all of a sudden realizing, I always thought saving for a rainy day, that that's always in the future. It never actually occurred to me that one day it would rain. And we continue to do that kind of thing where, you know, what, still have a mortgage to pay off, but that's okay, because we went to Spain the next year. And just re rejig some of our own priorities that work for us. How did it work? Well, wouldn't it be great if I said, oh, it was a complete success, you know, A plus on all of it. Uh, it worked, most of it worked very well. I did get back into shape, I took advantage of working from home, I get more done with less stress. So most of it worked really well. I did, I'm going to be honest with you, I had some challenges. Um, so first of all, I decided, OK, I mustn't work at all. Because if I'm really going to survive this well, I really need to dissociate from work. But then I feel guilty, because I actually really love my work. So it was this whole, like I was, work was my mistress, if there's the right thing. Like I shouldn't really like working, but I really love my job. So there was kind of negotiating that. Waking up feeling. Like, I'm supposed to appreciate each day more than anybody else in the world. Am I actually appreciating this day enough? Am I getting the most of this day? I shouldn't have sat watching TV for an hour, because what a waste that was. I'm never going to get that hour back. The guilt of, I should be out, like, accomplishing something in the world. I should be making my mark. I should be... So having to find a way to moderate that whole appreciating every day, but not with the pressure of having to make every day the most spectacular day in the world. I can remember for two years, two years, it haunted me that we were away in Newfoundland on holiday and I had a bowl of ice cream. Two years that haunted me. It had sugar in it. I had given up sugar. I remembered it distinctly. I remember the choice to order it because it was homemade ice cream and it was delicious. And I tasted a bite of my husband's and I thought, I want that. I'm on holiday. I had it and we walked back to the place we were renting and the whole way back, all I could think of was, I ate a bowl of ice cream, I ate a bowl of ice cream, I ate a bowl of ice cream. I've just wrecked everything. I've, ate a bowl. I've, re I've ruined everything. Everything was ruined because I didn't have any sense of a reasonable relationship with food at that point. It was all about trying to get control of something. And also freaking out because I ate a gluten-free organic cookie, right? Because that also apparently was going to devastate my world. So I made choices about what to control, and it wasn't an easy relationship with those choices at the start, that's for sure. And they've, they've evolved. Also, I don't know if anybody else has this experience, um, 
I look at every tiny spot differently, every lump or bump differently. Um, I know everybody in our doctor's office very well. I've um, pulled Dawn out of conferences to come home because I had a spot on my neck and clearly now it was on my neck and we had to go and get this checked out because we were going to have to have the surgery right away on my neck now and it's a freckle. But I, I don't really have a reasonable, um, I think it's shifting, but I don't necessarily have a reasonable view of the lumps and bumps on my body anymore. And, um, and that's hard to kind of negotiate because all of us, our bodies change every day and I know that intellectually, I know that. All of us, our bodies change every day. Our cells turn over on a very regular basis and so we're gonna get more freckles and different lumps and different bumps and we're gonna get different things as we get older. Our hair texture is gonna change. But now we can often at times are hypervigilant about what's that mean and the stress of what that means. And it's coming back. And then knowing that stress isn't good for us, so then stressing about being stressed about it. And it can become this really vicious circle. And then you don't want to throw caution to the wind and not be mindful at all. But how do you have this relationship that kind of you can make work so that you're mindful of what's going on, but it's not controlling you to such an extent? Is that resonate for people? Okay. I have spent many years helping people with anxiety. I don't have it. I help people with it. I don't know what's going on with my whole heartbeat racing out of my mind. I don't know what's going on that I'm scared to talk in groups. When, when I first started realizing I had anxiety, I don't, I don't understand what this thing is. I don't understand why I'm constantly worried all the time about every single thing. Realize oh crap, I've got it. That stinks. I've got it. And so now I have new coping skills to deal with anxiety. Right? I couldn't imagine having a panic attack. You know, just breathe, just, oh, just tell yourself it's fine. Right? Being in an MRI machine, not long ago, this year, having an absolute full-blown panic attack because I was sure, they hadn't injected me with the dye yet, but I was sure they had, and I was the one in 100,000 that was having the reaction, and I was having a heart attack, and they were gonna need to know this, because they were gonna need to get the paddles, and I was squeezing that ball. If, if anybody's had the MRI experience, they put a ball in your hand and you squeeze it, and they weren't coming fast enough, so clearly they weren't in the room, so I started getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Okay? So now I get to deal with anxiety. And I like to think, as I said, I believe you can learn something from every experience. So I like to think I'm a more sympathetic um, and empathetic healthcare provider now when I'm working with folks who struggle with anxiety. Okay. So those are some ideas of things that I've done. Some of them have worked great, some of them haven't, and most of them have evolved in the journey that I'm on, so that I'm now in a pretty good place. Some days are great because I forget I had cancer. Some days are great because I remember I had cancer, and that helps me to remember, yeah, you know, I'm not going to worry about that thing right now. So it's all about perspective. I think sometimes it's hard to know how to quote unquote do survivorship. I don't think there's any right way to do it, which means I don't think there's any wrong way to do it. I think it's very easy to judge ourselves. How did we tell so-and-so? What do we say to so-and-so? How do we explain this to so-and-so? What do we say to ourselves? Maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't have eaten that bowl of ice cream. Maybe I don't think there's any right way or wrong way to do it. I think it's identifying what's your way. It's not gonna be, I don't know anybody who goes through it and doesn't have any kind of hiccups. So I think you do the best that you can and realize that you're doing the best that you can. I think it's important about, uh, that we own our own process and our choices because as we've all talked about tonight, there's so much that we can't own, that we can't have any control over at all. And so when there's little things that we can, I think it's critical to take those little things, provided they're positives, they have a positive impact in our life. So I wanna go back to control um, and just find out, does it feel like we're on the same page in terms of control being uh, an issue? There's so many issues to deal with in control. Okay, lots of nods. It's feeling like one of them. What we know from research is control is one of the most important determinants of our health. We used to think that, um, that all the high-stress job CEOs, they would be the ones having the most heart attacks. And we couldn't figure out why they were surviving their heart attacks or not having them at all. And what it came down to is because they're in control. The people at the top are in control. 
and that control has a protective mechanism over us, both mentally, emotionally, and physically. So we've got to figure out what are we going to do with all this great advice. There's so much of it, it can be hard to take it all in at once. And what if we never wanted to make a change in the first place? You know, for a lot of people, cancer can be a gift in their life that says, hey, you know what, it's time to make a change. I read an article in Reader's Digest that uh, was entitled, Cancer is a Gift Wrapped in Barbed Wire. And I felt, that, for me, that felt like an accurate description. And yet, I wasn't really looking to make any changes. I was going along pretty happy, pretty tickety-boo. Things were, things were going along. And so I had to park my resentment that this happened to me. And make sure you realize, no matter what has brought on your cancer, you did not do this to yourself. We know that there are certain things that help us reduce our risk of cancer, but there is no cure that we know of for all of the cancers in the world. So you did not do this to yourself. Know that. So it's okay if you didn't actually want to make any changes in the first place. The changes have been made. You now have changes in your life. And one of the things that you get to decide is, okay, what do I want to do with some of those changes now? And some of your answers might be, right now, I just got to feel what I'm doing. I just got to feel what I'm going through. And that's part of the process too. So I want to talk about where to start. So I want to do some brainstorming, and this is just so we can keep a record of some of the things. There's no right or wrong answers. What are some of the things that are really important in your life? Family. Family. Creativity. Creativity. Work. Independence. Work. Independence. Positive attitude. Positive health. health. What components of your health? The ability to be normal. Quote unquote normal. We can also look at physical health, mental health, emotional health, spiritual health, sorry, friendships, travel, and the ability to travel. Anybody have pets that you care about? Okay, pets, support, hobbies. So this isn't an exhaustive list and it's not meant to be. It's more just to say, let's get the ball rolling a little bit. What I'm going to invite you to do, and this is completely at your choice. In no way, shape, or form do I want to force anybody to do anything they don't want to do. And so this is an invitation. And you can do it and decide that it doesn't work for you and chuck it. Or you can decide that this is a good idea for you and, and keep it totally up to you. The invitation is, in your handouts, there's a wheel. And in those segments, each of this is, a, if this is a pie and each of these pieces is a segment, I'm going to invite you just to write down one or two words in each segment. So these are things that are important to you in your life. Whether they're getting any attention or not, it does not matter. These are simply things that are important in your life. And you can break this down however you want. So you can have um, kids, work, you can have it be your, your health wheel, so it can be a wheel, you know, can have physical, emotional, spiritual, Totally up to you how you want to do this. Just invite you to, to stick some words in there. As you're looking at the components that you've identified as being important in your life, and notice the one where you really feel like, I'd like to make a change in that. And just put a star there. Don't worry about how you're going to make a change. Just put a star there. So some questions I'm going to ask you to think about for yourself. What's important about making a change in this component, really? How will changing this, how will making a change in this component serve you? So my invitation is to really allow yourself to be grounded in what's really important about having a change in this for you. Really important about it. In what way is it going to serve you in your life? The next part takes this reflection from being an interesting thing to think about to trying to make it real 
is I want you to I invite you to think about what's one thing, big or small, one thing that you can do towards making a change in this area. One thing. It can be as small as taking five minutes out of your day and having a bubble bath. Or it can be as big as something else, your wildest dreams, whatever it is for you, I invite you to one thing when our lives feel so out of control. What's one thing that you can do and own it? Even if it's whatever it is, you can't do it wrong. I just invite you to think of one thing really to do for yourself. And then the next question is, will you actually do it? Will you gift this one thing for yourself, to yourself? And I don't mean that whole, yeah, eventually. I mean, like, really, will you actually do it? By when? By when will you do this for you, whatever your one thing is? And I invite you to actually write down a date or a time frame. Part of making this real is, um, for some people, it's telling someone. Who will you tell that you're doing this for yourself? For others, it's putting it in your day timer or your Blackberry or your iPad scheduler or whatever it is. What will you do to remind yourself to actually do this? So, wherever you got in this process for you, I encourage you to trust that that's wherever it needed to get to for you. Because for some, all of us are at a different point in our process. And for some of us, it's just, my choice is to not do anything right now. That in of itself can be taking some control. Okay. So wherever you got to for you is, is exactly where you needed to get to for that. Bottom line that um, I hope has come out of our chat is that this is your life. It may not be um, steering in the direction that you thought it was going, and this is your life. You are in charge of it. You do have some control even when it feels like you don't, even if it's a tiny, tiny, tiny little thing, some little way to treat yourself kindly. Um, my invitation and encouragement is to, to take that up because you deserve to be treated kindly um, throughout a process that can be quite brutal. My hope is that you found that the focus of our discussion today has been to invite you to step into whatever it is that you choose to take control over. Um, some things we don't have control over. And so sometimes it's finding the little nuggets that maybe we weren't looking for before and changing our standards of what we can actually um, do and, uh, and letting that feel okay. And I also invite you to think about how do you want your new normal to be? Okay. I've never had the experience of going back to normal. I've just kept moving forward into a new normal. And my understanding is that that's more common for folks than not because it's very hard to have every day forgetting that you lived through cancer and that you are continuing to live with, live through cancer. Thank you so much for being here tonight. It has been a true pleasure. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your warmth and kindness because it is the first time I have ever shared anything about my own story. And so thank you for, um, for your receptivity. Thank you. Mm -hmm.